sigh Can I doubt His tender mercy Who through life has been my guide And may peace, divinest comfort Hear my faith in Him to dwell For I know whatever befall me Jesus do with all things well For I know whatever befall me with all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, my soul the thirst may be gushing from the rock before me though a spring of joy i see gushing from the rock before me though a spring of joy i see all the way my savior leads the fullness of his love perfect rest to me is promised in my father's house above when my spirit clothed in mortal brings its flights to realms of day bless my song through endless sages Jesus led me all the way bless my song Savior leads me. That is wonderful news. Welcome, everybody. Please stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, to feed, to guide, and to shield me. I shall not want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still and quiet waters. He refreshes and restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort and console me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed and refreshed my head for me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed and refreshed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell forever in the house and in the presence of the Lord. That is wonderful, wonderful news. Let's sing to him this morning. I count on one thing of the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting of the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, 
will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Nothing can stand against I choose to pray To glorify, glorify The name of all names And nothing can stand against Let's hear it I choose to pray To glorify, glorify The name of all names Nothing can stand against I choose to pray Glorify, glorify the name of all names That nothing can stand again Oh yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy All my days Oh yes Trek kids, you are dismissed to the back. Everyone else, turn and give someone an awesome greeting. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you'll keep this conversation, these conversations going after the service, which is a hint to stop them for right now. <laughs> morning, I'm Barb. Welcome to the journey. Glad you're here. Um, look forward to worshiping together. And um, I just have a few announcements before we get started. With, well, with, before we continue, I should say. We've already started with some amazing worship music, so thank you for that, guys. Um, first of all, we have Connect cards on the tables. Um, for those of you who are here in the room, these are an opportunity to connect with us, thus the name. Give us your information. Um, you'll get our weekly prayer updates and our weekly announcements. There's also a place for prayer requests and thanksgiving on the back if you want to share those with us so that we can be praying with you and praising God with you on those things. Um, if this is your first time filling out the card, we have a spot on the back where you can mark which of our partner ministries you'd like to receive a small donation in your honor. So make sure you mark that as well. And if you're joining us online, feel free to give us that information at info at journeyoflongmont.org. We'd love to connect with you as well. 
Let's see. A couple of announcements. First of all, next Sunday after the service, we'll be having a good old-fashioned potluck. Love to have everyone stay for that, try some new foods, meet some new friends, catch up with old friends. Um, if your name begins with A through M, please bring a side dish or dessert. If your name begins with M through Z, please bring a main dish. I'm going to be a little bit organized about this, sort of unofficially. So if you have questions about that, talk to Alyssa Miller, who is not here this morning, but is in the, um, the program folders. Her phone number's in there, and, or you can come talk to me, and I'll connect you with her as well. The ne other thing that's happening next week, and no, we didn't really put these two things together and plan them on the same week on purpose, but that's the journey for you. We are also having our mission trip meeting, planning for next summer in the Dominican Republic. So if you have any interest at all in learning more about that, Come to the potluck, grab some food, and join us in the library for a few minutes to talk details about that. We'd love to have you. And if you have questions, talk to Angela Budak. And her, announcement, her information is in the um, jottings and the programs. Um, if you need to join remotely, if you're interested but you won't be able to be there in person, get to connect with Angela and we can get you a link to the online meeting because we're going to do that as a hybrid so people who are not here can participate. All right, there are more announcements in the program and the jottings. Um, details on our new MOPS group, upcoming work day at the Journey, update on the capital campaign, and more. So make sure you check those out. I'm going to um, transition a little bit to our offering, which is something that we do here every week. Most of you have heard this spiel lots of times. We believe that everything we have comes from God and that we just give back out of gratitude for him and honestly to remind ourselves that it's not ours, that it comes from him. And he asks us to do that, and so we respond. So there are boxes in the back where you can put your offerings um, or you can give in any of the ways on the screen up here. Every week we highlight one of our tithe partners that we give part of our offerings to. And this week the highlight is Calvin and Jamie Hoffland with Resonate Global Mission working in Guinea, West Africa. So you can read a little more about that on the screens as well. And finally, a few prayer requests to share. And... As most of you know, we have a prayer station over here. Um, during worship time at the end, you're welcome to light a candle. Um, haven't talked about those in a while. The yellow candles are for prayer requests. The blue candles are for people that you know that don't know Jesus. And the red candles are for praises. So this isn't some kind of magic or mystical thing that makes your prayer stronger. It's just a physical way that we physical people can, can do something to remind ourselves that we're praying and to connect with God in a more meaningful way for us. But if you see someone who brings up a candle, you can join them in prayer. You may not even know why, but if you see a blue candle, you could say, Lord, bless that person that they're praying for and draw them to you. And you can, we can join each other in prayer that way. So that's a really powerful thing. We do have three specific prayer requests. And after the service, these and some of our other requests will be on the screens during our time of prayer um, after the message. The first one is new, and that is um, many of you know John and Susan Hoffland, and many of you know their daughter, Rebecca who had her baby last night. Owen was born um, with some issues related to meconium and is currently in Oakland Children's Hospital. So praise God that he is with us, but please pray for Rebecca and Greg and little Owen that he will recover well. Um, we're also praising God for the good days during a challenging time of health issues for Michelle Newman, who is actually with us this morning. So this is one of those good days. And we're glad to have you here, Michelle. I'm glad that some days are going better. Michelle had a mouth biopsy this week and is scheduled for a reversal left soldier replacement surgery on September 15th. So pray for a corrective course of action to address the results of the mouth biopsy, the upcoming surgery, and the healing process that follows. So we'll, you'll be in our prayers, Michelle. And um, prayers for Hannah Williams' grandfather who tested positive for COVID. Family's unable to visit and it's challenging to communicate with him. So um, that can be really isolating. So pray for him, pray for his healing. Also, Hannah's mother and sister need a miracle to resolve family legal difficulties as they seek justice for a case for Hannah's grandfather and, and the estate. So pray for their financial burdens in this emotionally challenging time um, and for healing for her grandfather. And finally, every week we pray for two other churches. This is to remind us, among other things, to remind us that we're part of something bigger and it isn't just about us that there are people all over the world who are also celebrating and praising God this morning. So today we are praying for Trailhead Church here in Longmont. It's a new church plant um, that's actually meeting in the old St. Stephen's Church building now, I believe. So they have moved into that little space where the well was. 
Um, the well has moved to another building, so everybody's moving up in the world. So we'll pray for Trailhead, and also for the Springs Community Church in Austin, Texas, which is part of our Christian Reformed Church regional group. And finally, of course, we're praying for Calvin and Jamie Hoffland, our tithe partners this week. So I think that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Scott Tillian, who is leading us this morning. Um, Scott is our director of spiritual formation here at The Journey, and he is giving us the message while Rick is actually in Boulder at Crestview Church, giving their message down there. So thank you, Scott. You're welcome. <clears throat> Good morning. I come out of the, uh, the mountains to, to greet you at the Sanctuary of the Mountains where Patty and I have been spending a lot of time. We just uh, did a trek uh, through Italy, France, and um, Switzerland. I'm trying to remember the countries we walked through. but. 117 miles, um, almost 40,000 feet of elevation gain. Got to walk in um, the country of uh, St. Francis a little bit, and uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about this morning. Uh, he's kind of been a, a mentor for me for many years. Um, matter of fact, uh, my campus pastor from back in Nebraska was a big fan of of St. Francis, and uh, I had told him that I would started a new biography about Francis. Uh, if you're interested, check this book out. Um, and he said, oh, great. Have I ever told you about Franco Seffirelli's movie, Brother, Son, Sister Moon? I go, yeah, actually, 40 years ago, you showed it to us, your campus group, in your living room. He goes, oh, yeah. Um, I've been a proponent of that film for a long time. So he had forgotten he showed it and stirred up a lot of us young college kids to, uh, to f kind of follow in the ways of Francis. So, and uh, he was one who actually kind of, along with stirring my love for Jesus, stirred my love for 14ers. And um, he was the one who first introduced me to climbing, which hasn't stopped since then. But Today I want to, I guess, I don't know if this is really a sermon so much as stories of St. Francis, and uh, maybe you can just sit back, try to walk the path of St. Francis with me, and um, we'll see what we can take away from it. So I don't know if this is on or not. Oh, here we go. Can you move that if I... Oh, now it's working. Okay. So, uh, G.K. Chesterton also wrote a book about Francis, and this has been a, a kind of a quote that I've been really hanging on to over the last few months as I've read through St. Francis. And it is perhaps the chief suggestion of, of his book, his biography, that St. Fran Francis walked the world like the pardon of God. I mean that his appearance marked the moment when men could be reconciled not only to God, but to nature, and most difficult of all, to themselves. So it, it really stirred my thoughts. What does it look like to walk as a pardon of God and to have that said about you and your life? And so uh, a lot of his history, a lot of his stories play out his walk as the pardon of, of God. In case you wondered what he might look like, this is a, a, a painting, a mural in the um, San Francisco Basilica in Assisi. And it was painted by Jimabu. And within a generation of um, St. Francis, so many think this is a pretty good likeness of St. Francis. And you can see in the bigger panel, he's the small figure on the right, which would seem appropriate for the lifestyle that he lived. But um, you would say he's not an attractive man. He was small, he was thin, he was sickly a lot of his life, but something about him drew people to him. By the time he had died in 1226, there were 40,000 uh, little brothers 
Friars Miners, and Poor Sisters of Clare. So within his short lifetime, he started a movement from himself to his 12 initial disciples to 40,000, and it's still growing to this day. So I guess you probably want to know uh, how did his life start. So I'll, I'm going to kind of start the stories uh, beginning with his growing up period. And he grew up in a very wealthy family. His father was a merchant, cloth merchant. And he was acquiring land, uh, people in distress. And so he was becoming very wealthy. And Francis, in his early days, was known as a partier, wine women song. Uh, he was probably the most popular teen out there because he could afford to throw the biggest parties. And so everyone loved Francis. And he was a bit of a showman as well. But his um, kind of underlining desire was kind of fame, not so much fortune, but the fame of a knight. And it was a time certainly of of war, the Crusades were going. Uh, the period that he grew up in around, he was born in 1181, was kind of characterized by wars, wealth, disparity of wealth, militarism, tension between the Christian West and the Muslim East, and a lot of conflict in the church and corruption. Um, one of the biographers of the time said of the spirituality of his time, and I'll, and I'll read the quote. Living under the regime of landed property, the clergy were absorbed in the management of temporal affairs to the neglect of the priestly ministry. Priests preached little, studied not at all, practiced simony. I had to look up that word. It's a buying office or buying promotion. Um, and they lived loosely and lazily, having it would seem no other concern than the exercise of power and the possession of honors, pleasure, and money. Many prelates made a display of unheard of luxury and had recourse to traffic and church benefices to maintain it all. And as for the people, their moral and religious status was on par with that of their pastors. So it was not a good time in the church and in the culture, the climate of the time. And of course, they the raised up many prophets during this time um, to condemn this. And they were swarming across Europe. Elizabeth of Schonau said, woe to all the nations for the world has become darkness. The Lord's vineyard has perished. The head of the church is sick and his members are dead. Do you sleep shepherd of the flock? I know how to waken you. I was trying to figure out how which he was going to wake them, waken them, but I'm sure it wasn't with niceties. Um, the, the Pope at the time, Pope Innocent, said the only thing that can fix this would be fire and the sword. So it was kind of a dire time, and that's the time that St. Francis kind of entered his teen years and his life. Um, and so entered the the invitation to war, his desire to be a knight. And he was wealthy. He could afford the armor. Not many could afford the armor to become a knight in that time. So he outfitted himself, and he joined the army of Assisi. This was during a time when town would battle town. So Assisi was against Perugia. And they had a battle for dominance, I don't know, Longmont, Boulder, something like that, you know. And, but we wouldn't dress up in armor and go over there, would we? Um, but anyway, so he rode into battle. And he was unskilled, of course, no combat training. And he was captured immediately. Uh, on that day, 4,000 Assisians were killed. But he was spared because they could tell he had wealth. And so he was captured, and he was put in prison for a year. And he contracted a serious disease, and he was sick in this time. And so it took a year before his father would ransom him. And this became kind of the moment of rethinking, 
Um, of course, if you're in prison for a year in the dark dungeons of the Middle Age prisons, it, it offers a time of contemplation, I suppose. But when he got out, there was still another invitation waiting, and this was from Pope Innocent, and that was to enter the crusade. And so he still had that desire for glory, to be a knight on the battlefield. Many were look, looking for the spoils of war, but he had this picture of being knighted on the battlefield. And the night before he left for this battle, he had a vision. <clears throat> And it's his father's house was filled with arms, bales of cloth disappeared. The merchant trade of his father disappeared and it was replaced with magnificent saddles, shields, lances, and a beautiful and charming bride was waiting for the bridegroom. And Francis wondered, what is this? And he began to get excited. I'm gonna have success on the battlefield and I'm gonna have a beautiful bride. He awoke with happiness and he headed off to the battlefield. But often as I've read through Francis, his first interpretation of his visions and dreams wasn't always correct, which um, I guess gives me comfort. If I ever have a vision or dream, um, rethink, think about what it is because you may be wrong the first time you think about it. And such was not the interpretation of, of his dream. Uh, and we'll find out in a moment. Um, that night, on his first stop in Spoleto on the way to the war, Francis had another vision, another dream, and a voice, the same voice spoke. Francis, where are you going like this? I'm going to fight in Apulia. Tell me from what, whom can you expect most? the master or the servant? From the master, of course. Then why, why follow the servant instead of the master on whom he depends? Lord, what would you have me to do? Return to your country. There it shall be revealed to you what you are to do, and you will come to understand the meaning of this vision. So the next morning you abandoned his mission to become a knight, and he came home to some ridicule, but there was a happiness that the Lord had spoken to him. And he began to rethink further and to reflect and to repent, to, to rethink his way. And his peers who enjoyed his parties wondered what had happened. And he, so he said, okay, one last party. This will be the grandest of all parties. So they were excited and they were doing their reveling and partying and Francis didn't follow after them through the streets and they wondered, well, what's, you're different. What has changed? Ah, you found a spouse. You found your bride. And he said, yes, I did. And she's more beautiful than you can even imagine. Does anyone know the spouse? It actually was Lady Poverty. Lady Poverty was the spouse that he was drawn to through, this, through Jesus. So from that moment on, his life is beginning to change and he hasn't really um, figured out the path. He's met his spouse, so he thinks, Lady Poverty, but the road is unclear. What is the meaning of the vision of the servant of the warriors and the swords and the soldiers that accompanied him and his beautiful bride? Um, so as he was going through town in his still clothed with the wealthy man's clothing, he came across a beggar and he spoke with him. He gave him an offering and then he thought, Let's exchange clothing. And the beggar was, oh, okay, let's do it. And so they, he gave him his extravagant clothing. He took the clothes of a beggar. And to become like the beggar, he began to beg and to sit with those that were begging. 
And it was not long after this that he wore this clothing down the path to the leper colony. In the past, the, the leper colony was, was something that he avoided. He, couldn't, he had an abhorrence of the leper, a fear, and he would not even go down the road from Assisi where the leper colony was. But he went, he met a leper, he sat with the leper, he conversed with the leper, and then he found himself giving him a kiss of friendship. He kissed the leper, something that had been his greatest fear. So his, his path had definitely changed, but what he was doing was giving away wealth that he had that was his father's. And his father was not happy to see this change in his son that he had hoped would take over his business. So his father decided to take him to court and to say, he's giving away my bolts of cloth. And Francis stood before the magistrate and said, okay, fine. This is where I need to find my real father. So he stripped off his clothes. And I believe the biographers say totally and he laid him before the magistrate and said, today I trust my father in heaven. And we don't really know if there was a reconciliation or not between father and son. Um, knowing Francis, I'm sure there probably was, but so the magistrate, the, the bishop of the area gave him a clo uh, some clothing to cover him and he went off. Um, so he spent some time waiting, listening. After this moment, he was cut off from his past and still waiting to hear from the Lord. So he would make a habit of going to the San Damiano Chapel, which is still there to this day. And I hope to, to see it at some point. But he would go there and pray. And one day he was sitting in the chapel and he was listening and praying before the crucifix, which the crucifix is still at this church that he would pray before. And it was, Christ was on the cross and it spoke. It whispered from the cross, Francis, go repair my house, which is falling in ruins. And Francis was like, what? Go repair my house, which is falling in ruins. And of course, he's sitting in the San Damiano Chapel. At that time, was, it was falling in ruins. It had been almost abandoned. There was still one priest associated with it. And so he interpreted these words as, I am to fix this church. I am to rebuild churches. So he went about the business of, of collecting brick, stone, would, I will rebuild the church. And his biographers say, he, he may have been doing this for a couple of years, going about repairing, rebuilding churches. But again, that isn't what Jesus from the cross was asking him to do. Jesus was asking him to restore the church, the body church universal. It wasn't about the building. It was about the culture of the church, the people. Jesus wanted him to rebuild the people. This is the word that um, uh, the biographer said. Francis knew now that it was not to build chapels that God was calling him, but to cooperate in the restoration of the church so he lost no time in setting joyfully to work to preach penitence. And he, the Franciscans are pilgrims, um, so they go all over, and maybe this is how their movement spread so fast. But he would go about and preach. He would preach the restoration of the church. And one of his biographers, Thomas of Silano, said, his preaching, he began by wishing peace 
to the congregation, to the people gathered, to the people outdoors, to the people on the path, speaking without affectation, but with such enthusiasm that all were carried away by his words. Peace be with you was always his greeting. Again, walking the pardon of God. As lay reformers spread across Europe, they were interested in confronting church leadership, confronting where things were falling apart. But Francis had another way about him. He was awakening something of a new beginning, awakening faith, and it was done in a way of, of peace, pardon, and love. He began to be the embodiment of the Sermon on the Mount. They could see in him, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and certainly blessed are the peacemakers. So after a few months of, of preaching, others started noticing and soon there were others that wanted to follow in his way of taking on poverty and following. And within a few months, there were 11 of them. And it began to be a feeling that there was a movement that they had. And Francis, being submissive to the church, said, I will go to the Pope and ask for permission to form this new brotherhood, the Little Brothers, the Friars Minors. So he went to Rome, and this poor man spoke before Pope Innocent III and got his blessing, and then started heading back to Assisi. And so here's one of the stories, I guess a series of stories that just illustrate his life. He was, he and the 12, he and the 11, the 12 of them were heading back, and they found a little lodging to stay at in Rivo Torto near Assisi. And it was a little hut. And it was just the size for 12 guys to lay down and a few of them to get up and pray during the night. And they made this their home for uh, almost a year. And they based their preaching out of Rivo Torto. But it came to an end out of a singular event. And that was a peasant came one day with his donkey and hollered, in with you. And this is the hour of prayer for Francis and his, and his brothers. But the peasant brought the donkey in and kind of made the words like, this is the only place for us. And Francis, quite distressed, uh, didn't really say anything. But then his biographer, his, the brother said, truly brethren, our God-given vocation is not to play the host to donkeys but to pray and to teach him in the way of salvation. And so he left with his companions. So again, he did not confront, he didn't assert his rights. He left and they went on. One of the bishops of the time asked Francis, why do you have such austere places to live out in the open, out on the ground, in abandoned huts and, and your food is not lavish? And, and Francis responded, you know, if we owned our place, if we owned goods, then we would feel the need for having arms to protect us and laws to defend us. And I don't want to live that way. So that became his way of, of living, just of surrendering, relinquishment. He had no need to protect anything because he had nothing. He was, again, in love with lady poverty, and maybe a better word for it would be lady simplicity for us. As I've, I've tried to relate, how could I hold on to lady poverty? And really, maybe the word is lady simplicity, the simplicity of holding things loosely. So another story. And I'll probably run out of time before the stories end. So, you know, if things go long, just give me the little signal. Um, but there were, uh, one of the places that some of the brothers were staying, um, 
and Brother Angelo, which was one of the initial brothers, was kind of the porter, the greeter at the door. And um, three thieves came and knocking at the door, begging for alms, begging for food. And Brother Angelo, who was a former knight who had converted to become a friar minor, said, and this is the quote that history brings down, what? Murderers like you, not satisfied with robbing honest folk of the fruit of their toil? You want to take the little belonging to God's servants? You, who have no respect for God or man and don't deserve that the earth should hold you? Get out of here and don't let me see you again. Well, that's not very brotherly exactly, is it? And um, Francis coming back heard about what had happened and these were his words to, to Brother Angelo. You have behaved like a man with no religion. Does not the gospel which we have promised to follow declare that it is the sick and not the well who need the doctor? Take this bread and this wine in the name of obedience and go and find the robbers. Run up hill and down dale until you find them. And as soon as you see them, shout, Come, brother robbers, come and eat the good things that Brother Francis begs you to eat. So Brother Angelo takes off bread, wine, eggs and cheese, because Francis threw that in there as well. And, and he said, go and serve them gladly and with good humor. I myself would be grumpy about this if I was told to go do this. But Francis knew he served with good humor. And you know, before long, their conversion of the three robbers was complete. Initially, they were bringing wood and firewood, chopping, collecting to the brothers. And before long, they were fires miners as well and died the death of saints. But again, walking the pardon of God, that was Francis's way. Another interesting story. You know, the crusade was going, Christians, Muslims, and it was fierce. And in 1219, Francis and some brothers decided to jump on a ship with some of the crusaders that were on the way to Egypt. And in the back of Francis's mind, he said, I, I want to speak with the Muslims. I want to offer them the gospel. But, um, you know, this was a far cry from wanting to go fight them when he was in his 20s. So he went on the boat. They first landed in the island of Crete and then made it to Demetia, which is on the uh, Nile Delta. And he stayed there for several months. And at one point, he heard that the crusaders were wanting to make a decisive battle. And Francis was very distressed about this. And he had another vision about this. He, and he, so he said to his companion, the Lord has revealed to me that the Christians are running into a new defeat. Should I warn them? If I speak, they will call me crazy. If I keep still, my conscience will reproach me. What do you think, brother? And his brother said, well, judgment of men matters a little. It won't be the first time you've been taken for a fool. Tell them the truth. So he did, and the leaders mocked him, made fun of him. And then if you look at the history books, that battle was a total disaster. 4,000 crusaders were killed, blood was flowing. And Francis, who couldn't bear to watch this, had messengers come back and forth, and he wept bitterly over this loss of life. But over time, some of the, the knights began to esteem him for his honesty and speaking about this defeat. And before long, many of them were abandoning their call to arms and choosing the life of the Friar Minor. So many knights from that time became friar, Friars Minors. 
Well, kind of the moment came where he wanted to approach the Sultan and he wanted to speak to the Muslims. And this seemed crazy to the Christians, the Christian Knights, because all they had thought of was slashing their throats. Why would you want to go and talk to them? So he went and he spoke and the Sultan said, I will listen. And a uh, little story that um, sometimes you don't know what's legend and what's real, but um, this has come through many biographers that he, uh, the Sultan said, okay, the true religion, why don't you, you and my priests enter the fire and whoever remains alive, that's the truth, I will follow that. And <clears throat> Francis said, okay. But at that time, the, the Sultan's princes were starting to slide out. So it was only Francis there. So that wasn't going to work. So the Sultan tried some other things and ultimately said, I don't know that I can accept your teaching. And Francis thought, OK, I'm not going to get anywhere with him today. But as he left, the Sultan said, OK, pray for me that God might reveal the good and perfect way. And so Francis did. But if a short time later, Francis was, was still there. Um, reinforcements came from one of the cardinals of the Pope. And there was a massive destruction. And Damietta fell on November 5th, 1219. And Francis was there at the taking of the city. And his weeping was more bitter than than before, because his way was a way of peace and reconciliation. The Christians, and, and this is sad to say, the, the streets were strewn with corpses. The captors fought like wolves over the immense booty, selling the captives at auction, except keeping the young women for themselves. Francis wept over this. So this is uh, story after story of Francis becoming the pardon of God, walking as the pardon of God, and the reconciliation of God. So as he went on, as he aged, as he health became more of a factor, there was a time where he uh, was determining, do I keep preaching? Do I keep walking? And he asked some of the brothers to pray, and Sister Claire, who I've not mentioned, that's another whole sermon, I think, but what should we do? What should I do? And they said, you're to keep preaching. You're to keep walking. So immediately, he's with his brothers, and there's a, a flock of birds in the, in the tree. And this is one of the famous sermons of St. Francis. This is Giotto's painting that's also in um, the Basilica of San Francisco, preaching to the birds. And he saw the birds. And for Francis, who became the patron saint of the environment and, and uh, animals, he had a special relationship with birds and with all animals. And he began to preach. My sweet little sisters, birds of the sky. You are bound to heaven, to God, your creator. In every beat of your wings and every note of your songs, praise him. He has given you the greatest of gifts, the freedom of the air. You neither sow nor reap, yet God provides for you the most delicious food, rivers and lakes to quench your thirst, mountains and valleys for your home, tall trees to build your nests, and the most beautiful clothing a change of feathers with every season. And the sermon goes on. And after the sermon, the report of the brothers is they, the birds bowed. And they flew off in the, in the shape of a cross. And so the, uh, there was this connection that Francis had with animals. That you've probably heard of the, the wolf of Gubbio. Has anyone heard of that? I'm sure you. There was a wolf. Gubbio, who was terrorizing a town. 
and Francis determined to go talk to the wolf. And his brother said, no, this is foolish. So he went, <clears throat> and he found the wolf, the ferocious wolf, and he preached to the wolf and said, I know that it's your hunger that's making you kill animal and people. Repent, and I will have the townspeople feed you. And so he, the townspeople agreed to feed, and from then on, the wolf and the town were friends, and they mourned the death of the wolf when the, when the wolf died. So there, there's so many stories. Um, there was the, the rabbit that followed him all over like a puppy, the fish that he would plus in the lake, so many animals that had a connection with him, which um, in my time in the mountains, there was a day we were with friends that I almost felt like Francis, that we saw a mother bear and two cubs, we saw a moose, we saw a pika, we saw a marmot, we saw a ptarmigan. It was like a little gift that God had given and on our trek, I got to see an ibex, which is almost a magical creature but there's this connection that we have with all of creation um, that Francis certainly felt and rejoiced in. So towards the end of his life, um, one of his famous um, songs, poems, the canticle of the creatures he was at a time of feeling the torments of the devil, feeling forsakenness. He was wondering where his brotherhood would go without him. And this song, this came out of him. Almost high and all powerful, good Lord, to you belong praise, glory, honor, and all blessing. Be praised, my Lord, for all your creation, and especially for our brother son who brings us the day and the light he is so strong and shines magnificently oh lord we think of you when we look at him we praise my lord for sister moon and for the stars which you have set shining and lovely in the heavens he talks about brother wind sister water brother fire sister earth our mother and then he added a stanza at the end of his life to welcome Sister Death, whom we must all face. At this point, um, you may have heard of the story of receiving the stigmata of the, the wounds of Christ, the nail prints in the hands and feet and the, and the open wound in the side and it was at a time when he was nearing death and more and more his brothers could see him carrying the image of Christ in all he did, living out the Sermon on the Mount. And as often as people pray this, that he prayed that he may understand and see the sufferings of Christ. He asked Christ for that and it was at this point that an angelic being and that had the image of Christ came and gave him the stigmata. And this prayer came out of that. You are holy, Lord, the only God, and your deeds are wonderful. You are strong. You are great. You are the most high. You are almighty. You, Holy Father, are king of heaven and earth. You are three in one, Lord God, all good. You are good, all good, supreme good, Lord God, living and true. You are love, you are wisdom, you are humility, you are endurance, you are rest, you are peace, you are joy and gladness, you are justice and moderation, you are all our riches, and you suffice for us. You are beauty, 
You are gentleness. You are our protector. You are our guardian and defender. You are our courage. You are our haven and our hope. You are our faith, our great consolation. You are our eternal life, great and wonderful Lord, God Almighty, merciful Savior. Amen. And I find that many of the paths of the saints and mystics of old, of modern days, that the further they go into the image and likeness, being formed in the image of Christ, the more they see that God is good, they find that he is good. They don't see the angry God, they see who he is, the God of love, gentleness, peace, patience, kindness. And after a life of, of hardship, and I mean, there were trouble in the order at the end where some of the brothers wanted to take it a different direction, maybe a little less connection with Lady Poverty. But all of this weighed on him, but yet, the further he journeyed, the more he saw how good God is, how God is love. So, <clears throat> some summary thoughts. There's a lot to take away from, from the life of uh, St. Francis. Um, this, this, this quote, his conversation was the sole object was to extinguish hatred and restore peace. If that could be our preaching, our teaching, our daily lives, this would be something. Extinguish hatred and restore peace. Peace be upon you. Creation, which Francis said to him was the first Bible, even before Genesis, which speaks of who God is. And Francis read it every day. So I guess maybe that's my encouragement to all of us. Read the written Bible, but read creation every day. Be outside. The Sermon on the Mount was lived in his life. His way of life was not to criticize or condemn, but to live the life of pardon. And really, during this period of time, he reawake, reawakened a faith that had been slumbering in people's hearts. And he started a whole movement called uh, the Third Order of Franciscans. And those were um, followers who maybe didn't take the vow of, of poverty, but were um, so maybe smitten by the way of Francis that they adopted many of Francis's ways. And um, some of the uh, written down order for the third order was to love God, to love one's neighbor, turn away from our sinful tendencies, receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then produce worthy fruits of penance, a renewed life characterized by charity, forgiveness, and compassion. So many people signed on to this. And looking at the history, so I just looked at a few. We had Dante, we had Giotto the painter, Raphael, Cervantes, Michelangelo, Franz Liszt, King Louis the, um, of France, Joan of Arc, uh, John Michael Talbot, if you know him, that became a third order Franciscan. They had wakened a faith within so many people in this time and place. And one of their articles, and, and maybe I leave you with this, the, the last sentence. Secular Franciscans should devote themselves especially to the careful reading of the gospel, going from gospel to life and life to gospel. That's our call. Life, gospel, life, gospel. Living the life of pardon in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 
an example of your life, of the life of Christ in a person. And may we strive to emulate some of his life and certainly emulate our master, Jesus. Be with us now as we sit, contemplate, we pray. Heavenly Father, we come today to raise our praise to you. Lord, we look at your creation, the birds, the animals, the lakes, the mountains, the beauty, the harmony, the perfection. It all demonstrates who you are, and it all praises you. And today, Lord, it is wonderful to recognize that your people, your children, have been given the gift of being the only ones who can choose to praise you. So today, Lord, we choose to raise our hearts, raise our voices, raise our love to praise you and your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand as we worship. Thank you. 
won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. by day is a sign that you are with me. The fire by night is the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. You took me by the hand, and you 